When most people think about church, they think about a big building with a giant steeple on top. They think about their favorite pew and all the people they see inside. But when Jesus talked about church, he never talked about a building. So you can do church from your couch or from your home. You can do church with just one other person or all by yourself because church was never ever about all that stuff. Being the church was all about God and bringing him to others. So we're going to continue to bring church to your kids by teaching them about the life God has.
One of the things that I love to do when I'm spending time with the Lord is to take a passage of scripture and turn it into a prayer. That way it feels like I'm having an actual conversation with him and I can be sure that whatever I ask for will be granted to me as it is written in his word. If you would allow me, I would love to pray over you 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 9 through 13. Dear Lord, thank you for AGIF. Help us continue to be a community that shares freely and gives generously to the poor. May our good deeds be remembered forever. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, we pray that you will provide and increase our resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in us. May we be enriched in every way so that we can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, may they thank you, Lord. We pray that as a result from our ministry of giving, the needs of believers are met and they may joyfully express their thanks to you. May they give glory to you as a result of our ministry and may our generosity to them and to all believers prove that we are being obedient to the gospel. For your weekly giving, please scan the QR code that you see on the screen or go to AGIF's website. Ben and Grace, it's wonderful to be with you again and I just so appreciate taking part in the Holy Spirit series and I know that you've been on a bit of a journey and I'm jumping in but I'm very excited to be sharing on Acts chapter 10. This is a fascinating story and I encourage you to read it in your own time but there's sort of three main role players. There are two influential leaders and both of them are good men. One's name is Cornelius and he, the Bible says, feared God, he prayed much, he gave to the poor. The other influential leader was Peter, who was an apostle and a leader in the early church. Peter was living in the major um, Jewish port of the time called Joppa, and Cornelius was staying at the major Roman port, which was called Caesarea. They were in the same country, and yet they were living worlds apart. And the third role player is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the one who enabled them to cross the great divide. Now I have a question for you. Are you the kind of person who when you read a novel goes straight to the back 
and wants to read a few pages first to see what happens at the end and then reads the rest of the novel. Well, if that's you, I'm happy to tell you, I'm going to tell you the end of the story first. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 48, the Bible says this, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come out with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is an amazing story. What a great ending. The gift of the Holy Spirit had now been poured not only upon the Jewish people, but on the Gentiles as well. Amazing. But I have to tell you that this story was a long time coming. There's a long backstory for, before this happened. And so I want us just to have a quick look at what I call Peter's journey away from prejudice. You see, Jesus had told his disciples that they were to preach the gospel to all nations. In fact, he had said to them that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you with power and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so they knew that God's heart and the desire of Jesus was that the gospel went to all nations. On the day of Pentecost, Peter himself actually stands up and he begins to say and, and quote the prophet Joel and says, In the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people, not just the Jews, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But you know, two years after Pentecost, the only one that we see actually reaching beyond the four walls was Philip the Evangelist. And he starts reaching out to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he brings him to salvation. And then he goes into Samaria and he brings them. He, they, they also um, got to know of the Lord Jesus. And Peter and John go to Samaria and they pray for the Samaritans that Philip had ministered to. And they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit too. But, and it seems like the Jews in Jerusalem were okay with this. That these people, the Samaritans and the eunuch, were coming to Jesus. And I think probably... Because the Samaritans were kind of considered to be half Jewish or maybe backslidden Jews. And then the eunuch himself was Jewish. And so when they came to faith and when the Holy Spirit came upon them, the council at Jerusalem or the Jewish people in Jerusalem seemed fine with it. But you know, it was seven years on and Peter was still preaching only to the Jews. God gives Peter a vision. In fact, he gives Peter a vision three times. Now, it seems that Peter often needs to be told something three times. And so even in this case, he needs to be told three times. And the, this vision of, of animals coming down on a sheet, both clean and unclean, come from heaven. And God says to him, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. And at first Peter resists because he is, he is born Jewish. And, and, and inside him, he knows that if he eats something that is unclean, that he then becomes unclean. And he resists what God is saying. But then God begins is working on Peter's judgments of what is pure and impure. And he tells Peter not to call anything that he has called pure, impure. The Holy Spirit then also speaks to Peter and says, don't hesitate to go with the three people who've come to your door. Because the people who came to his door were Romans. And he encourages him. He, sa he, he says to Peter, I have sent them and you need to go with them. And at the same time, an angel is also appearing to Cornelius. And, and he says to Cornelius, you need to go and call for Simon Peter, who is in Joppa, who's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. He gives them very specific instructions. He's working very hard behind the scenes to get these two influential leaders together. Now, a lot of prejudice had to be overcome in Peter's mind when it came to Cornelius. First of all, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Now, the Roman were the oppressors of the Jew. In those days, they had, they had um, overcome them, they had occupied, and they were oppressing them and had done for decades. And so whenever they saw a Roman soldier, they knew and were reminded that their freedom was gone and that these people were actually the oppressors. And he was a leader. He was a centurion. So he was at least over 100 people. Another prejudice or another barrier that Peter would have to overcome is that Cornelius was Italian, so he was a different nationality. Potentially there could have been a language barrier, but at least there would have been cultural differences. But most importantly, 
Cornelius was a Gentile. The Jews had traditionally viewed unclean animals and Gentiles in the same light. If you ate an unclean animal, you became unclean. If you went into the house of a Gentile, you became unclean. Now it's very important to realize that these weren't actually the laws of God. These were the laws of Jewish Pharisees between the time of Malachi and when Jesus came for about 400 years. These men made very strict laws for the Jewish people that weren't in the heart of God. And one of these laws was concerning the Gentiles. And Peter had grown up under this. And so he had to really overcome prejudice. And if you think about the word prejudice, it actually means to prejudge. So you don't even know the person and you prejudge them. So you look at them, the, either the, the, the way they're dressed or the color of their skin or any, it's something about them from the outside. You prejudge them before you even get to know them. And so it's so interesting because Peter goes because the Holy Spirit had encouraged him to. And the Bible says in Acts 10 verse 27 to 28 that Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So Cornelius had called a lot of people around. And this was Peter's opening words. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or even visit a Gentile. I mean, you've got to give it to Peter. What a way to break down cultural barriers. As he walks in, he says, you've got to know that it's, I'm unclean now because I'm associating with you. And I want to encourage you when we work cross-culturally or when we start to build bridges into other ethnic groups, or when we start to build relationships, often we might actually even say wrong things. And what blessed me is that this Roman centurion took, took the low road, or actually the high road. He didn't get offended by the first thing that came out of Peter's mouth, because you know, Peter was a verbal processor. And it seems like whatever was in Peter's mind came out of his mouth. And so he was, I think that the centurion realized that Peter was processing everything. And also he had come in, even though he was a leader of many men, when P Peter walked into his home, the Bible says that he fell down at his feet and Peter actually lifted him up and said, stop bowing to me because I am only a man. So this was a very big deal. And, and I think that he realized that, that God was rewiring Peter's mind. Peter said this, but God has shown me that I should not call impure or unclean anything that he has called pure. And Cornelius begins to tell Peter about this angel that had appeared to him and, and starts changing his misconceptions. And then Peter begins to speak. And this is my favorite part of the story. He says this, I now realize you can see his mind is getting rewired. It's getting renewed. He says this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation from every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. He realizes God does not show favoritism. He, the Jews are not his favorites. The Gentiles are not his favorite. But he accepts from every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right. And so Peter begins to speak to him about Jesus. And he gives him a, the clear gospel message. And he testifies of, of what Jesus had done. And you know, before Peter's bias could kick back in, before he could think, well, should I pray for these people to receive the Holy Spirit or not? The Bible says the Holy Spirit fell on them. I think the Holy Spirit wasn't going to, wasn't going to chance it on Peter. It was like before anything could happen, he, just be, he fell on them and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the most beautiful thing happens. They ask Peter to stay with them a few days. Now remember, before what I was speaking to you before, is that the Jews would have been considered unclean if they had stayed with Gentiles. And yet I know the best way to overcome bias and stereotypes is to get to know the person and to get to know their stories. In 1995, when South Africa, because I'm South African, and when there was a change, when apartheid came down and Nelson Mandela became president, I started doing and helping lead some reconciliation, racial reconciliation seminars. And we had the, heard the most amazing stories from people. And we got all the different colors of South Africa together and we began to speak to one another and share our stories. And I remember many, many beautiful incidences, but the one that really sticks out to me was um, a young man who was sitting at the back who was an Afrikaans white uh, policeman. Now, no one knew that he was a policeman because he wasn't in uniform, but I knew him. 
And of course, he was sitting at the back listening to the Zulu people tell their stories. These people had come from an informal settlement, a shanty town. They lived in shacks. They had really suffered under the, the apartheid regime, and they were really poor, and they had suffered a lot of racism. And they started to begin to tell their stories. And you know, I could see this young man at the back, he came in very defensive and, and very nervous and very anxious because he would have been one of the people who, who had done the acts of racism. And yet as he listened to these Zulu people tell their stories and began to see them not just as, as, as a huge group of people, but as actual, actually as individuals, as people who are human, as people who have lives. As he began to hear that, I could see that his heart was beginning to open and then his heart broke. And I really want to encourage you, the more we spend time with one another and the more we listen to one another's stories and begin to see how we are all human, we are all part of the human race. Race as, itself, as such is just a, a human invention. Yes, I know they're different ethnic groups, but we're all part of the human race. And so as we begin to hear one another, then our hearts begin to soften. And I just also want to encourage you that bias doesn't just take on the form of race or color. There's so many different biases. It can be gender. It can be an area that someone lives. I mean, the Bible says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, obviously, yes, because Jesus did. There can be socioeconomic groups. You can look down on someone because of maybe their poverty level. Education levels, maybe you look down on someone because they're not as educated as you. There are a host of different biases that we can fall into. And so we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to change our hearts. Peter was criticized when he came up. After he had done this, he came up to Jerusalem and the circumcised believers criticized him. And they said, you went to the house of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. And so Peter sat down and he spoke to them and he said, this is what happened. He told them about the vision. He told them about Cornelius's um, angelic visitation and how the Holy Spirit had fallen even on the Gentiles, and that God shows no favorites. And so in Acts 11 verse 8, they had no further objections. They said, So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted the gift of life. I wish I could tell you that that was the end of the story, and that there was no sign ever again of any bias in Peter's heart. But that is in the reality. And that's not the reality of our lives as well. You know, with all we're seeing happening in the world at the moment, it would be wonderful if we could just say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and have no prejudice. But really, that's impossible. We're all growing in this area, and we're growing in, in purification. And at times, we tend to fall back into old thought patterns, or even we might even have blind spots, especially if we have a family that um, leans towards being prejudiced or a very judgmental family or community that we might have grown up in. And so for a, a few years later, we see that um, Paul and Barnabas were, were in Antioch and Peter joins them. And while he's there, there are these Pharisaic Judaizers who are the people who really stick to the law. And they're insisting that everyone needs to be circumcised in, or, in order to actually be a believer, whether they're Jewish in, in heritage or not which is really not true. And so we see in Galatians that Paul begins to say, say that Peter fell back, that he, he feared them and he began to sit with them and he drew back and separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. And you know, Paul went to Peter and he withstood him. He even says it in Galatians. I withstood him to his face and I said, you hypocrite. And he begins to tell him, you can't do this. You know, you, you, God has already done all this in your heart and you are living free like a Gentile. And yet now you're biased towards these people again. And I know that sometimes a trap that a lot of us fall into when it comes to bias is that when we're with people who are the same as us, the same culture group or maybe the same economic status, we can have this sense of false solidarity. And before we know it, we might actually just be allowing a joke or a a comment or a glance that we normally wouldn't have allowed, but we don't stand up against it. But Paul was not like that. You see, Paul, even though Paul was Jewish, he, he was a Roman citizen, whereas Peter wasn't. And I wonder whether Paul just had a greater understanding of the Romans and had a, a greater openness to who they were. And so he withstands Peter to his face. 
And you know, we all need people who we open our lives to and say, if there is bias in me, if there is prejudice, if there's something, a blind spot in my life, then please tell me about it. I remember my brother, Ian, who did this to me when I was a, a teenager. We were in um, Durban, South Africa, and we had had a maid who lived with us for, uh, for many years. And I was probably about 14. And the one time, I, sp I can't remember what I said, but I obviously spoke very disrespectfully to our maid. And my brother called me aside and he said, Esme, do you know that image, which was her name, do you know that image is someone's mom? And I remember as a 14-year-old that my, it just actually changed my mind. I was like, you see, I had never seen her with her children. And I, and I thought to myself, I would never speak to my mother like that. And that changed my mindset. My brother coming to me and saying, she's someone's mom. You wouldn't speak to mom like that. Changed the way I saw our maid and changed the way I spoke to her. And so sometimes we need people to come into our lives and just to highlight that and bring a light into those areas. Okay, but it seems that um, Peter does come right and he and Paul then stand up in the uh, Jewish council and begin to speak against mandatory circumcision and the Gentiles are not uh, forced to do that. And so that is good news, but the journey was up and down, just like with all of us. It's going to be a little bit up and down and we need to open our hearts to what the Holy Spirit can and wants to do. So it's important that we all admit that we have bias. I mean, that's the first thing, is that we need to be aware that there is bias in some area in our lives. And then we can rely upon the Holy Spirit who is willing to change our hearts and also to bring reconciliation. You know, when, when Peter speaks on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, in the last days, God says he will pour out his spirit on all people. That's all races. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy all genders. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams all ages. Even on my servants, both men and women, all genders, all different classes of people. He's saying the Holy Spirit will fall on everyone. God has no favorites. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we just thank you so much that you've come. And you've come to bring reconciliation between us and God. And Lord, that you have come to bring reconciliation between us and our fellow man. And Lord, I thank you for a new humanity. Lord, I thank you for the human race that you have made. And Lord, the, the reconciliation and the healing that you can bring into all of our hearts. And so first of all, we just want to say sorry for areas of bias and prejudice that we do have in our hearts. Lord, we know sometimes they're blind spots and we ask you and we welcome you to shine your light on those things so that we can change more into the image of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you help us as we, as we journey along this to be bridge builders, that we would be people that you use to build bridges into different communities, different classes, different genders, different um, ethnic groups. Lord, that we wouldn't hold back in our own little comfort zone or with our type of people. But Lord, that we would be willing to step out and begin to hear the stories of other people. And God, begin to open our hearts to everything that you are doing. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you that you will um, complete this work. Father, I thank you and that your word says that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so we thank you for your love that is in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would continually remind us of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ez, for preaching. It's always a pleasure when you come back to preach for us. Uh, now, as some of you may not know, but uh, Ez and her husband, Brad, served here in AJF for many years. Now Brad is the pastor in Suzhou International Fellowship. Now, today is also the first Sunday of July, and on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion here at AJF. And I thought, 
uh, what better way than to you know, share communion together with you and hopefully we are remembering our Lord's death for us and recognizing the body of Christ with the people we are now uh, worshiping God together with here in our Sunday experience. So just to review, communion is remembering the body and blood of our Lord Jesus given to sacrifice uh, in sacrifice for our sins. And in communion, we recognize the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. W would you be so kind mm -hmm. as to pour that? Additionally, we recognize the presence of Jesus, the body of Christ around us, not least being our fellow church people in all churches around the world where Christ is worshipped. And, and so that's why I thought we could do this together. And thank you for sticking around for this. Mm -hmm. uh, as we begin, let's uh, confess our sins quietly in our hearts. Uh, confess your sins to God, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Let's say together the words on the screen. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. And now shall we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, on the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, this is is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So go ahead and take it now. As, um, when you're able, would you close us in prayer, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, that um, because of what you've done, Lord, that we are able to be one. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus that is able to cleanse away all our sin. And we thank you, Lord, that, um, the, the, that you carried all our sickness in your body on the cross for us. We just thank you for the great act of redemption. We're so grateful. And we're so grateful that we can be one body. And we thank you because of you that we have been made one. And so thank you for um, the body of Christ. Thank you for Abundant Grace. Thank you for Sujo International Fellowship. Thank you for the communion that we share because of you. Thank you that we know one another because of you. And so we bless you, Lord, we're so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Ask the Preacher is an after-service Zoom meeting going deeper into the Word. Got some questions about the message you heard today or simply want to talk more about it? Be sure to join the Zoom meeting to get into conversation with the person who delivered the message and others. The meeting starts at 4.44 p.m. just after the 4 p.m. service. You can find the meeting ID on the screen now. Parents with children, be sure to check out the Kids Church video online via the app or the website. There are so many ways to stay connected and get plugged in during this season. Be sure to check out the calendar to see what's happening, including online life groups, prayer groups, and so much more. 
And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.